What is K-pop? Is it a genre? Is it an industry? Where does it exactly come from? And why is it so popular? Well, if you've asked yourself questions like these, then keep watching. Cause today we're diving into the world of K-pop, the good, and the bad to try and understand this global phenomenon. I'll also be sharing some of my personal experiences and thoughts about the music that changed everything for me as an artist. So let's blast off and get started. JM in your universe. According to our friends, I'm Jonathan Miller and welcome back to Jonathan Miller Music, helping you become a better indie artist. I make electronic dance pop music and every Wednesday on this channel, I'm helping others take their music to level two. If that sounds good, consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell, maybe giving it a like. If not, oh, so you're one of those people. That's fine. I'll just remember this little interaction next time I see one of your videos. Oh, who am I kidding? Hitting the sub button is a lot of work. Never mind. Think about it though. <laughs> All right, so today we're diving into the world of K-pop. Now this is going to be a bit of a different video for me and a bit more extensive than my previous genre definition videos. The goal of this video is to not necessarily make you like K-pop, but will hopefully help you understand it from both a musical perspective and as a fan. I will of course also be sharing my personal experiences with K-pop as both a fan and an artist. This subject is very near and dear to my heart because it not only drastically influenced my development as an artist, but it also really hits home due to my close upbringing with people of many different Asian cultures. Also, please know that in order to provide a spherical look at this genre and industry, I will also be later talking about the darker sides of this industry, including darker mental health issues. So consider this your trigger warning in case any of those subjects might upset you. That being said, this video will not be all doom and gloom. And if at the end you find yourself wanting to learn more or hear more examples, cause you know the whole YouTube thing is gonna make it really hard for me to put a lot of sounds in this video. Or maybe you just wanna check out some great music. I have put together a full Spotify playlist featuring over 10 hours of K-pop music across all of its four generations, which you can check out with the link in the description. I hope that it will help you appreciate some of these acts, including many fantastic ones be beyond the example that I used in this video today, even more. Which is actually a great segue to begin, because in order to truly appreciate something, you've gotta know its history. So with that, let's get started. A brief history. Modern Korean pop music can be traced all the way back to the late 1800s when American missionary Henry Appenzeller would teach British and American folk songs. In Korean, these were called tungha, and basically they were Western melodies coupled with Korean lyrics. The root of K-pop still stems from traditional Korean music called gugok, which in itself consists of folk, poetic songs, and religious music. One of the first official K-pop albums documented in 1925 was called This Tumultuous Time by Park Tae-son and Lee ryu Seik, and it actually consisted of Japanese songs translated into Korean. This is because of Japanese colonization at the time and their occupation of the Korean Peninsula. Following Korea's liberation from Japan and the eventual Korean War, which lasted from 1950 to 1953, U.S. troops remained in South Korea. This caused American and world cultures to spread and gain acceptance throughout South Korea. Due to its poor financial climate after the war, many Korean singers would actually sing for U.S. troops as a way to earn money. In 1959, the Kim sisters started to gain international success and became the very first Korean act to release an album in the U.S. market. Beatlemania also arrived on the shores of South Korea, which led to a love of group sounds rather than solo artists. This saw the eventual formation of groups like Ad4 and Key Boys. In the 80s, popular Korean music experienced what's called the ballad era, in which ballads or softer songs performed better than before. In the 90s though, the true beginning of modern idol culture really began. Korean artists were influenced by Europop, as well as hip hop, rock, jazz, and EDM. Seo, Taiji, and Boys are often credited for paving the way for modern K-pop acts by incorporating rap and hip hop into their music, which is a very common staple of K-pop nowadays. The 90s also saw the formation of what are known as the big three entertainment companies of South Korea. SM Entertainment, 
YG Entertainment, and JYP Entertainment. HOT, a five-member boy band created by SM Entertainment in 1996, is considered the first official idol group, and their business model, which was adopted from J-pop, in which talent is selected before and trained extensively before debuting, set the precedent for many groups following. The Asian financial crisis in 1997 also made South Korean acts look for new markets to break into. So, groups like HOT released a Mandarin language album in China, and girl group Diva released an English language album in Taiwan. Following the financial crisis, K-pop experienced a low point. There was rather little activity and interest until the popularity of BOA, TVXQ, and Rain started to gain international success. BOA became the first K-pop star to top the Oricon charts in Japan. Her Japanese fluency and musical style at the time led to widespread acceptance of her as a bona fide J-pop artist even though she's Korean. Five-member boy band TVXQ also saw success in Japan, following BOA with their album Purple Line, as well as their subsequent releases. Rain was able to sell out a 40,000 fan concert in Beijing, China, thus officially ushering in the second generation of K-pop, which lasted all the way until about 2013 and 2014. Throughout the second generation, K-pop acts tried to break through the notoriously difficult US market with groups like 21, Wonder Girls, Girls' Generation, and BOA herself in 2008. While success was only able to remain moderate, the first Korean acts to chart on Billboard in the US were 21, Girls' Generation, Wonder Girls, and boy group EXO. Psy also broke a major milestone by becoming the first YouTube video to hit a billion views with his music video for Gangnam Style. Girls' Generation also won Video of the Year in 2013 with their hit I Got a Boy, which, coupled with social media, helped to open the doors for the third generation of K-pop with acts like Red Velvet, VIX, GOT7, GFriend, TWICE, Blackpink and BTS, who have all now garnered international success, and by 2019, K-pop had become the sixth biggest music market in the world as its fourth generation currently begins to unfold with groups like ITZY, ESPA, Tomorrow and Together, and LUNA. Genre or industry? A common misconception about K-pop is that it's just an industry. It's all a machine and it's really not that deep. But it's actually both a recognized musical genre of music and an industry. The confusion tends to occur because its visual component is just as much a part of its identity as its sounds and sonic construction. K-pop is a hybrid genre of music that is influenced by many, many genres of other music, including ones like experimental, jazz, rock, gospel, hip hop, rap, R&B, reggaeton, electronic, dance, folk, country, and classical, and of course its root in traditional Korean music. K-pop music is purposefully designed to be as widely acceptable as possible, and in the music world, English is one of the most commonly spoken languages. Therefore, K-pop acts tend to use English in their group names, song titles, and occasionally their individual stage names as well. A defining feature of K-pop is using carefully selected English hook phrases, especially in the chorus, which helps K-pop's marketability. K-pop idols are also trained in foreign languages, especially Chinese English, and Japanese to be able to communicate in other countries as well. Another reason K-pop can confuse its Western audience is the distinct way in which the industry actually works. As opposed to the West, where artists tend to be a bit more individualistic, K-pop idols are more like employees of a company. Think of each comeback as like a work schedule, in which idols must perform during, and then when their cycle ends, they disappear for a while, and promotion for another group begins, like workers at a job clocking in and out of their shifts. Now, this is not to diminish the work of idols in any sort of way, because a lot of the functionality of groups at an entertainment company are much more connected like a family, rather than in the West where artists at the same record label don't always do things together and can remain rather separate. Respect is built into Korean culture, language, and operations, which is why groups often recognize the oldest member as its leader and hold sumbes, which means seniors, in groups that came before them in high regard. Differing from the West, trainees can get signed to an agency at a very young age and train for numerous years before being deemed ready to debut. Trainees live together in dorms and study extensively music, dance, foreign languages, media training, video training, 
acting, and more. The cost of training one idol under SM Entertainment in 2012 was an estimated 3 million US dollars. New groups and artists are given a name, a marketing concept, and then debut through artists' showcases on TV and online. As groups grow and after they debut, subunits will occasionally be formed, but are still part of and eventually return to the larger base group. Many idols are actually not from Korea and can be from a wide variety of backgrounds in different countries, such as Japan, the US, Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, China, Taiwan, and many more. This multicultural genetic makeup of K-pop is part of the reason groups release albums in different languages such as Chinese and Japanese. This level of proficiency also allows them to promote, conduct interviews, and perform successfully abroad. Another faucet of K-pop is fan interaction. Fans will often pick their bias, which basically means the group member or groups that they like the most. This is very similar to fans of groups in the West, like fans of One Direction. Choreography is also also an important faucet of K-pop as well, and a fan's ability to recreate dance routines is often considered when making them. K-pop idols are kept to a very high standard as country ambassadors, company employees, and images of perfection in the eyes of fans. Unfortunately, with all the hard work, glitz, and glam comes a price. The dark side of the industry. If we're going to discuss the positives about K-pop, in order to fully understand it, it's important to know its dark side. Firstly, there is no age limit or length of time an idol can spend as a trainee. This means that one person in the same group can train for just a few months, while another member may have spent 10 or more years training depending on how old they were when they signed their contract. K-pop also receives heavy criticism for what are known as slave contracts. Trainees have been known to rehearse and perform without any sleep, under tight routines, and extremely high sets of standards. The standard of beauty in Korea is exceptionally high, and as such, idols are expected to achieve and maintain unrealistically slim figures and levels of physique. Idols are almost never allowed to date, especially not publicly, and if they do, it can actually be very detrimental to their entire career. Contracts like these slave contracts can actually be signed when a trainee is either 11 or 12 years old, and there can be severe financial consequences if they choose to break their contract early. After three members of TVXQ sued their entertainment company SM Entertainment to get out of their 13-year contract, they finally reached a settlement in 2010 when the Korea Fair Trade Commission rules that a contract cannot exceed seven years. Another difficulty is that K-pop idols are required to pay back the money that is invested in them in order to train them. Therefore, for many years after they debut, a lot of K-pop idols don't make very much money, regardless of how big their music becomes. They can begin earning revenue after they break even and pay it back. Exceptions to this are trainees from the big three companies YG, SM, and JYP. Trainees from those three companies tend to begin earning revenue as soon as they debut and don't acquire a ton of debt unless they break their contract early. In 2017, however, the KFT actually reduced these financial penalties and also made it more difficult for companies to force idols to re-sign with them, which is also a problem. And just like how toxic fans exist in the West, they also exist in the K-pop world. In K-pop, they are known as Sasang fans and anti-fans. Sasang fans invade the personal and private lives of idols by stalking, stealing personal items, harassing idol family members, sending inappropriate gifts, or worse. To Sasang fans, being recognized by their idol is a good thing. Anti-fans are conversely out to see the failure of idols or entire groups and will actually endanger the lives of idols. An example of this is with Yoon Ho of TVXQ in 2006 after he accepted a drink that was actually laced with glue that sent him to the hospital and was sent a threatening letter. Both Sasang fans and anti-fans will use social media, networking, and other means to obtain information on idols such as audio recordings, phone numbers, passports, 
credit card information, Twitter accounts, dorm and housing information, private social media accounts, videos, pictures, and more. Idols are supposed to be images of perfection, and with that level of pressure comes mental health issues. Many idols develop nervous disorders or paranoia like Heechel from Super Junior after being involved in a car crash with a Sasang fan. Even worse, with social media, idols can be on the receiving end of intense cyberbullying. This can unfortunately lead to depression or suicide, like the exceptionally gifted Chong Hyun, Gu Hara, and Su Li, who will always be remembered for the incredible human beings that they were. Fortunately, in response to these deaths, new laws are currently being worked on and proposed in order to ensure a positive change for the future. So why is it popular? Between slave contracts, Sasang fans, strict expectations, and more, why is K-pop so popular? Well, in order to answer that, I can't speak for anyone else, but I can tell you what it means to me. I jumped into K-pop initially during Gen 2 when Boa made her English debut in 2008, but beyond her at the time, I didn't know about the rest of the genre. I knew Boa from my Japanese brothers and sisters and was happy to support her English debut because people I consider family would tell me how much seen an Asian artist be successful in the notoriously difficult US market meant so much to them, especially an artist as beloved as Boa. They would tell me how she made them them feel seen. It wasn't until 2012, however, that my brother introduced me to groups like Shiny, Girls' Generation, FX, and XO that I really began to understand how my Japanese family might have felt. After the late 90s and early 2000s teen pop explosion here in the US, American music went through a variety of changes and different sounds, and as somebody who's always been pursuing music, I oftentimes felt like there was no artist that truly represented everything that I wanted to do. So when the world of K-pop finally opened up to me, my entire world changed. The artist within me finally felt seen. There was this entire genre of people doing exactly what I had always dreamed of doing. Working insanely hard, performing on variety shows, music shows, in different countries, speaking different languages. I not only found new music that I loved as a fan, as somebody who gravitated to those languages and musical sounds and performances and colors, but I also got to find Japanese versions of these new songs that I loved, which meant I could understand them a little bit better and I could better learn a language that was so so close to home for me. Watching K-pop idols' work ethics pushed me to work harder, to do better. I studied Korean and Japanese and traveled back and forth to LA to work on my album, and that whole initial experience really created a musical renaissance of influence for me. I have nothing but respect for K-pop idols, and I hate when I see Western media or people calling them robots. I understand critique of slave contracts and the machine aspect of it, but the Western music industry is also labeled the big machine. You get signed to a label with limited control over your work, you're given a loan to make music and sell records, which you have to pay back before you ever start making money, toxic fans and stalkers are big issues here in the West as well. K-pop may have polished and shined it a bit more, but we have a lot more in common than it seems. Our differences are also worth recognizing as well because that's what keeps both the Eastern and Western music industries unique. Referring to idols as robotic does nothing more than to diminish the years of training and work that idols go through and the personal sacrifices that they make. It undermines an entire culture that's built on respecting those that came before you. You don't have to like K-pop, but as an artist, you should at least respect what it takes to pull off that level of perfection. You don't have to agree with everything that occurs in the K-pop industry, but celebrating its growth as a beautiful cultural export and an opportunity to learn from others and watching that rise is absolutely something you should do. The unique quality of being a hybrid fusion genre of musical sounds and influences with sharp visuals that match is as alluring as it is riveting. Ultimately, we all wanna feel seen by the artists that we love and idolize regardless of who you are or where you're from. I can't speak for anyone else, but I can speak for myself. K-pop helped to fuse the bright colors and flashy dances from my childhood that I so craved with the sounds and music that I love the most. The talent, sacrifice, and hard, hard work of any idol 
will never cease to inspire me. To see the music and people that I love so much grow from a small force to a global phenomenon in a short amount of time is something I will always honor and celebrate. And if you take anything away from this video today, I truly hope it's that. So that is my video on K-pop. Question of the video, who are some of your favorite K-pop groups and why? Leave me a comment below letting me know. If you want to check out my Spotify playlist of over 10 hours of K-pop music, most of which are songs that I've been inspired by over the years, feel free to do so with the link in the description. And if you like me and you like what I do, consider joining me on Patreon like Mike here and all these wonderful people to help this channel grow and get all sorts of fun rewards, including access to my YouTube calendar to see what's coming to the channel. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on it and subscribe if you're new. I put out new videos every single Wednesday. Once again, I'm Jonathan Miller and I will see you next time. See you later. I am a machine.